Hello, um, thanks for coming and welcome. Um, we're going to talk about uh, relational databases and big data. The name of our talk is Relational is the, the Big Data, is the new big data. I hope someone in the audience will catch the reference to Orange is a New Black. Um, so uh, we're going to introduce ourselves first. My name is Miguel Angel Fajardo and I'm the CTO of uh, GeoBlink. There is a startup based in Madrid. Uh, my background is of software engineer. I mostly work in developing backend systems for, for web applications and then becoming a software manager in uh, the UK and, and the US. My name is Daniel Dominguez. I am the um, head of the data team in GeoBlink. Uh, my, my background comes from experimental physics where I did uh, Richard doing data analysis over massive amounts of data produced in the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. And then I moved to GeoBlink, where I've been working for the last two years, trying to do geospatial ana analytics to understand um, um, the environments and how they affect retailers. Cool. Um, just in case you are curious, GeoBlink is a startup based in Madrid, and uh, we're a SaaS company, B2B, and we build a, a very cool product. Uh, that our customers use to uh, understand more about the, the physical areas surrounding their businesses. It's a business intelligence geolocated area. So in the tech department, we do a lot of data mining, uh, data processing, um, dealing with all these processes with data, and then building a, a cool uh, front end to visualize all of it. So let's talk about big data. When we say big data, what do we mean about big data? Which is, is, is an expression that is interesting because I often feel that it means different things for different people. And it's definitely a buzzword that a lot of people use without actually knowing what's behind it. Uh, but if you ask the engineers, big data is the set of technologies that allow you to either uh, process or store data in a way that is distributed that then you can work on it in a way that is parallelized with different machines added. So you're going to be able to scale those processes easily. Um, so I guess if I ask here uh, to the audience who has worked on at least one of these technologies, please raise your hand. Um, right? So a lot of us. Um, well, uh, personally, I think that often working with these technologies is a little bit like running a marathon. And uh, let me explain myself. So these days, running a marathon is like the thing to do. Everyone is running marathons. If you're not running a marathon, why are you not training for your first marathon? And you should do it. Um, a lot of people around you has done it. And they talk wonderfuls of it. So there you go. You set off, and you start running your first marathon. Um, so when you start running, everything is fine. You think that people cheering you is cool. You're going to make a, a good time. Um, well, when you are going through the race, then uh, you start like wondering what the hell are you doing there? Is this all necessary? Uh, what am I getting out of all this? Um, by the time you finish, you really suffer a lot of pain, um, and you uh, really wonder what, what all, all the wonderful so of that it was. Um, so how there's definitely a hype in all, the, uh, in all this. Uh, how did we get here? So let me tell you a story that um, happened a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Uh, well, actually, it was this galaxy, but it was a while ago. It was in the 60s. And um, there was this thing called the Apollo program that was about sending um, people to the moon. And IBM, that was one of the companies that was in their consortium preparing this project, had a really difficult time managing the process of um, dealing with all the bits and pieces and the parts to build this huge rocket that is still, it has been the biggest rocket ever, ever built, even to this day. Um, so the, the systems they had at the time didn't work, so they came up with the information management system, the IMS, that was basically the first database that existed the way we know databases today. Um, it had a hierarchical structure where you would have um, parent nodes with categories, and then children coming down from those categories. This system was good enough to put someone in the moon. There's not a small feat, but um, it was a cumbersome structure. You, in order to access a, a child, you had to go through the parent. You couldn't establish relationships between the children. Uh, so it wasn't very flexible. And in the, in the 70s, at the beginning of the 70s, 
uh, they released this paper that is how all these breakthroughs happen um, called a relational model. So relational model uh, it was something that was invented at this point and uh, it was uh, uh, really powerful. It was the base for the IBM, IBM DB1 and DB2. That was DB1, the, the first really uh, relational database. And when we talk about relational model, is about how to model uh, the world that you want to build logic upon on in a way that you have entities that have properties, and some of those properties allow you to establish relationships uh, with other entities, and that's why it's called relational. So this was a really a, a breakthrough because it was easy to design, it was easy to understand, and it was also easy to implement. So in the 80s and 90s, we saw a big development of the relational database um, companies. Um, this, these companies became huge, put um, a lot of money into this, and this the relational model was widely adopted. So it was basically the de facto way of storing data in a system. And this actually worked really well, um, So because it was, as I said, easy to design it and to share with people so everyone would understand it and also to work on top of it. Uh, it had something called ACID transactions that I'm not going to explain because I assume everyone here knows about it. Um, but basically, it meant that you could very easily build uh, transactions that were fast, consistent, and that you could um, uh, put critical applications on top of it, and everything will just work, which, which was uh, great, and it will be easy to maintain. Uh, on top of that, we also saw um, all the different technologies, not just about these companies managing these databases, but all the, the stack of technologies, building clients and building ORMs. There's basically a way of um, showing the, the, the model in, in your logic. So it was all good and dandy. And then something happened. The um, 2000 arrived and, and the Web 2.0 happened. Um, so what happened here is that suddenly you had a lot of applications that demanded much bigger volumes of data that had to be processed much faster. Users were also using these systems more often, generating more data, and they also wanted systems that were faster. So system had to scale. Um, a relational databases had to scale. How do you scale systems? Well, you can scale them vertically and just throw more money into the hardware, or you scale horizontally and you distribute the data so that commodity hardware can, can process all these things. But scaling horizontally relational databases is hard. Because first, you have to find a way so that all the different nodes know about the data that is stored in each other, so that when I throw a query at one node, it will be able to contact the other nodes and, and retrieve the data that I need. Um, but there is a big problem that is making ACID transaction uh, distributed. Uh, this is hard because you have to insert things like two-phase commits, and uh, that is basically um, tell everyone that I'm going to do a commit, everyone checks that it's fine, everyone says, OK, now you can do the commit, then I actually do the commit, and in the meantime, all the transactions around that data are stopped. So this was a mess, and we couldn't scale this way. Uh, so what do we do? So a kind of uh, revolution was needed in the first decade of the 21st century, and a lot of research uh, was put to come with uh, new paradigms with overcome the limitations of relational databases. Um, uh, these led to uh, different papers. These are two examples, both from Google in this case, one uh, the MapReduce paper, and the other one uh, about big tables. And overall, they led to the growth of a zoo of different technologies, which allowed both to uh, work with data in parallel in distributed systems, and also they came with uh, different types of databases which were not um, relational. Um, but you shouldn't see them as different uh, separated entities, as you know, because you mentioned that you, uh, most of you use at least one of them. They normally coexist. Uh, in order to get the best performance to your problems. Um, these different databases were developed by uh, different teams in order to solve their own problems. And although they generally, they, they are actually very different among them, uh, we used to call them generally as NoSQL or not only SQL. Okay? Um, 
but they share some things in common uh, in, in globally, it, which is that they allow to non-locking transactions. They are much easier to chart with respect to relational, we, which makes them to scale linearly much easily. And finally, uh, well, they are, they are easy to chart. So um, I'm going to explain a little bit which are these families of NoSQL uh, databases, uh, because they're actually very different among them. But first of all, I would, to I would like to mention the CAP theorem, which comes from that age and basically helps you to get an uh, intuitive idea of how your database may perform um, and tells you that you should focus in, in three aspects about your database and, and which one you should decide. Uh, on the one hand, uh, you may think about partition tolerance, uh, relational databases, uh, traditional ones uh, normally work on the single node, so you're not distributing them. That's why normally you don't think them as the, they allow that. But if you go to a, if you scale horizontally and you have many nodes with many shards, in that case, uh, you should be uh, trying to partition, which basically means that uh, even if the network has a failure, you, your system is still uh, goes on. Um, uh, based on that, ba so basically if you have a shared system, you need that. But then you should think in two different things. If there is an um, uh, error in the, in the network, so some of your shards are not connected, it might happen that uh, the updates in one of the shards uh, might not be uh, spread to the others, so you need to make one decision. Uh, where either your information is consistent, so everybody, every user, attacking or querying the database will see the same uh, information, okay? In that case, you might not be uh, able to give a response all the time because if the shards cannot talk, they cannot up you cannot uh, update information across all of them. Or maybe you can uh, be available all the time, but with a penalty that the information might not be exactly the same for all the nodes if it hasn't been updated in all your network. Okay, so the cap theory essentially says that you can have just two out of three of these things. Okay, um, we'll see that this is a very simplistic uh, interpretation for uh, classification for the present databases, but at least gives gives us um, an intuition of, of a way of a structure of thinking about databases and what things we have to to think about. So uh, about NoSQL, uh, there are four main families. And I would like to start with the simplest one, which are key value stores, which are basically kind of uh, dictionaries or hash maps. So you have a key, which has some value or some properties associated. And it's very useful when you need to retrieve very fast information because you retrieve the data looking for a key, which is very fast. It's basically, basically uh, it is case flat with your with the size of your database. So whenever you uh, need to store user session data or cache data, in that case, that will be a very good answer because it's very very fast. On the other hand, uh, it's um, not that suitable when you need to do very complex uh, analytics when you have to deal with nulls or when you need when it's important to you to you the relation among records. You cannot, or it's very hard to do joins here, okay? A bit more complex and a bit more structured data are column-oriented databases. As in, in relational databases, each record is a row uh, in a table, and each table has a fixed number of, of columns. Uh, in column-oriented databases, you store data in each value in columns. Okay, uh, so aggregating, getting metrics for a column is very fast because you treat these columns independently. So you can uh, aggregate numbers very fast, whereas in relational, you need to scan all the rows, then remove the information which is not relevant to you and, and do the calculation. Uh, so they're very good for uh, real-time or near real-time analytics uh, over massive amounts of data. On the other hand, they're not that good when you need to retrieve just one row, one entry, one record, or a few of them because they are thought for uh, fast aggregations. And also, if uh, the, the structure of the data is dynamic, if your data nature, um, it changes over time, they are a bit limited in terms of restructuring your database. Maybe you will have to start from scratch, and that might be a huge con for them. Okay. 
Thirdly, we have document-oriented databases. While uh, key value stores resemble dictionaries, document-oriented databases resemble basically JSON files, um, where each record is, it, uh, has is a, um, a document with an arbitrary number of fields, which makes them perfect when your data is unstructured, which happens a lot of times, or when you need to merge data from many different sources. Many different sources will give you data with different fields, with, with different properties, and this way you can store them all, avoiding, in many cases, uh, joins. However, you cannot do joins. So when you do need to work on some uh, relations and they cannot be in the same schema, that will make um, some more complex uh, analytics uh, a bit more uh, painful. And finally, we have graph databases. Graph databases follow a completely different paradigm. Instead of focusing on the properties of each record, they focus in the, re they focus in the relation uh, among them. So you have a set of nodes, a set of agents, and you basically uh, have connect them through relations, so you know which one is connected to which one. This is very, very useful whenever you need to uh, do anything related to graph theory, like in uh, fraud detection, as the talk that we uh, attended before, or in um, um, mar um, financial marketing uh, studies, in spread diseases, or as we do at GeoBlink, for routine purposes and geomarketing applications. The problem of them is that because they, ba they fo focus in uh, relations, it's much harder to do uh, analytics and work with their properties. Okay, so uh, to sum up, there is no silver bullet for everything. Uh, probably you already knew that uh, you really need to understand very well which is your problem in order to decide which technology you should use. But most of these ones are have been designed for addressing just one particular or a set of few particular specific problems, they are not overall solution. In this case, uh, relational databases, probably they are more general purpose. Maybe they're not the best solution for each specific purpose, but they are very suitable and very good for the majority of them. On top of that, many of these uh, NoSQL databases are quite harder to and more expensive to uh, design to build and to a scale, which is another con. And finally, we are, most of the people are really used to use SQL syntax. It's um, very common among the community where each of these different uh, databases have their own uh, query language, um, which makes a bit harder the learning curve. It's not only learning about the technology you want to implement, but also it about the syntax you need to um, work and do analytics with your data. I have to say that in this specific topic, uh, a lot of effort has been put, and we count today where some of these of these systems have a syntax-like uh, language, like uh, Cassandra SQL, Google GQL, or we have five, we have Spark SQL. So in part, not all of them uh, have overcome with this, with this thing. So over in these decades, what happened? Let's go back to the relational world. Uh, and they also work and improved a lot, trying to overcome with these limitations that Mikael had mentioned before, and where the NoSQL databases were really uh, beating them. So today, uh, relational databases already allow to work with much less structured data format. I think it's now in the start and in, in SQL, uh, working with JSONs, with JSONs B, with uh, stores. You can have it in, in Oracle, uh, Postgres, MySQL, uh, SQL Server, okay? So you are able to combine both things and to work with data that, that by any means uh, wasn't uh, that structure without, uh, with avoiding having uh, lots and lots of nulls in your tables. On the other hand, right now you, it's in many of the databases, you have native partition partitioning, so you can split your tables in different uh, mini tables, which allows you um, a scale to improve the performance. You can have much faster responses. Um, you can, uh, which uh, much less cost, and and right now it's it's quite easy to do that. Okay. Um, thirdly, uh, well, in SQL in general, you don't care how the um, data is uh, all the pr is processed. You just say, I want this, select something from this table with these filters, but you don't know what's happening underneath. Okay, that's the query planner which takes care of that. 
So right now, the relational databases, they are also think about their query planners, think about how to parallelize things. So it also speeds up. It are much faster than the traditional ones in their single uh, in the in the in few decades ago. And also, right now, it's also so, uh, possible to share them both Oracle. Uh, we'll see some example now about Postgres and some others allowed to share them. So you're already able to um, to distribute horizontally your database. So that's lead us, that's and makes us think that uh, the cap theorem right now it's not something rigid uh, because it's more uh, kind of uh, how you opt and that's not that's not only applies to relational applies to all of one. It's more a matter of how you optimize like how you configure your database that you will be in one or in other side of the of this graph rather than just being something something fixed. Okay. And the the power of these uh, relational databases right now is so good that the main providers of uh, of cloud services have put a lot of effort in providing services based on relational. Uh, we have Oracle Cloud, Google Spanner, Amazon Aurora, or the much newer Cockroach TV or Citus, uh, because they have realized the how good they are for saving so many problems, how easy they are uh, to scale, to maintain, and to use by, the, by everyone. And actually, there are one, some of the services which are growing more about, about their, their stack. Just to, to put an example uh, about Postgres, which is what we, one of the things which we mostly use at, Post, at the GeoBlink, but not the only thing, uh, and that we love. It's uh, two ways of uh, sharding your relational databases. One is Postgres Excel and uh, another one is Citus. Uh, Postgres Excel is an uh, open source fork from Postgres, which is uh, fully acid for all your transactions. So it's uh, very, very suitable if you have a very intense scaling, but you need to keep your acid transactions okay, uh, to be consistent. On the other hand, we have Citus, which is also an open source extension in this case. They also provide cloud services, by the way, but I'm talking now about the extension. Um, being an extension has some advantages as um, it's also compatible with any other extension about Postgres and uh, you don't care about upgradings because it will be consistent. Um, in this case, acid transactions only remain when you work on one shard. Uh, and they are specifically focused when you for multi-tenant applications and when you need very fast analytics over the data. So after uh, this review of the last decades of uh, storing data, it's demo time. Cool, thank you, Tommy. So first, I want to mention a disclaimer. We don't really have businesses with Citus, apart from just being a user of the system. I'm going to mention them, not because we have any benefit in it, just because we, we used Citus and we think it's great. Um, so right, so I have a, a Postgres database here. And we're going to do it with Postgres because it's just the, the database system that we're more, more used to, um, to use. Um, and here you can see that I already created um, a table called demo table. So a simple table, it has uh, one integer and, and two strings, value one and value two. And I already filled these with a bunch of records. So I put 20 million records in it. Um, they have random values. So uh, at the same time, here, I have, uh, so the other one was the master, a master node. And here I have another three instances that are also running Postgres and Citus. So these are called the workers, worker one, worker two, and worker three. So currently, I have Citus configured, but I, I'm not using it. So as you can see, um, there, is no, there is no table created in any of the workers. So basically, the three workers are empty. All right. But I do have 20 million rows in the master node. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a query in the master node. And this query is going to be just some stupid query that is going to be super expensive. Uh, I just calculate the maximum of one value, minimum of another. Um, I have to parse the uh, string, the text as integers. And then I'm going to do some comparisons just for the fake of uh, figuring out how long this query is going to take using only the master node on 20 million rows. All those 20 million rows live in the master node, and currently our workers are completely empty. OK, so that takes almost 11 seconds. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this function that basically activates Citus. And what this function uh, does is that it tells Postgres that that table, the demo table that we have, is now a distributed table. And this is a method that is included in the Citus extension. So while this copies, that is going to take around 40 seconds. I'm going to explain a little bit more what's happening behind the scenes. So um, in Citus, you have the master node and a bunch of workers. And you always interact with the master node. You don't have to worry about the workers. Um, so the way that what Citus is going to do is every time I insert some data in the master, it's going to distribute it, it's going to shard it across all the different workers. And it's going to put, based on the key that I gave, that I gave the key based uh, the, the ID of the, of the table, uh, demo table, uh, so based on that key, it's going to shard it, and it's going to put it in different workers in a way that it knows where the different pieces of data live. Um, so now when I do another query to the master, it's going to distribute the query and all the different workers. I want to work at the same time in parallel, and I'm going to return the data to the master. It's going to then return it to me. So with Citus, you only have to interact, and your application will only interact with the master. And the beauty of this is that you can use simple Postgres. You don't have to learn any other languages or any new SQL. And you can just query uh, with your regular Postgres query, the master. Um, but it will have all the workers uh, behind the scene doing uh, work in parallel. So now uh, it finished. If I go to the workers and I, I tell them to give me all the tables, now you can see that I created a bunch of tables in all three workers. So now the 20 million rows, they live in the workers, not in the master. And if I query again the master with exactly the same query, it should take uh, less time. So 6.3 uh, seconds. This also depends on like, the query planner, all the things happening in the machine. This is a machine on our cloud. Um, but basically, we have almost half of the um, of the time it took with a performance increased by 100%. So uh, to, finish, um, to finish up, I have a couple of comments. Uh, first, um, I want to say that trolling is fun, uh, but we're not trolling here. Um, keep using your NoSQL. We're not saying that you should not use NoSQL and just go relational. Um, what we want to say here is that um, when considering your big data needs for analytics or for internal processing, now there is a new player in the, in the world uh, that is the relational databases that up until now, they were considered as old technology. But actually, because they are very easy to use, and now they incorporated all these new uh, features, they are as, as powerful as any other NoSQL database for the cases uh, that it adjusts to. So for example, in GeoLink, we do use NoSQL. Uh, we have Neo4j where we store the cartography that actually we have to bring from PostGIS because in Neo4j works better. We have Redis for a uh, user session, uh, React for data cooking, uh, MongoDB for uh, some unstructured data, um, and Spark for processing distributed data. That said, we have uh, found that some of the cases where you would use all these NoSQL databases, they actually work uh, better in Postgres. Um, actually, the new version of Postgres was released uh, only two or three weeks ago. And uh, for some of the cases where you would just stick to NoSQL, we are using uh, Postgres and it works fine. And the same, we are now prototyping with Cassandra for different needs. But because we are a small startup, we have to be very careful in uh, actually coming up with a few nodes of uh, Cassandra that we have to maintain because it could be a big burden on the team. And as a very final comment, 
there is the saying that goes, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So just because you have a hammer, you shouldn't just use it for all the different um, problems that you face in your companies. You should know your different uh, tools and your different technologies and understand before um, using one of them what problem you are trying to solve and just use the, the one that fits the, the best the problem. And that's it. You have any questions? Uh, hi, so I would like to ask about what's your view on the new operational databases, relational databases like NoDB, CockroachDB, or Google Spanner? Uh, so there's a big difference between Spanner and, and um, the cloud and, and the ones that you have to maintain yourself, that you have to host. The ones in the cloud, our experience is great, but you have to be careful um, about the cost. So depending on the amount of transactions, on down of queries that you do, um, you are talking about databases that are incredibly fast. You can put petabytes of data and it will return the, the, the data that you need. Uh, it will charge you based on the data that it has to process in order to return uh, the, the data for your query. So I would say if you have the resources, uh, definitely go for it because it's, it's really amazing, uh, like Aurora or Spanner. Just keep in mind that some of them they have different flavor. For example, Aurora is more towards the analytics side. Some others are more towards the transactional side. And also, when you start using one of those, you are kind of trapped. In uh, you, you basically you will have a lot of your data in this uh, in one in, in this provider, and it will be difficult to change. But if you don't think that will be a problem in the future, uh, then we definitely encourage. And uh, we also see a lot of tendencies going serverless. Uh, with uh, with putting also like uh, application logic serverless in the cloud, and uh, so I, I definitely think that is uh, um, a good option for the future to consider. Any other questions? Yep. Question here: What, <coughs> what about the client? The it's here, here, okay. here to your left. Uh, the sof the software stack, the client you connect to Cyrus or Postgres, etc. Any change? Anything specific? Danny, you want to take that one? Uh, well, uh, right now, uh, relational, I, I can talk for Postgres, which is uh, what I know more. Uh, it's very easy to address Postgres from, I would say, almost any other language, like Python, uh, which is the one that we most use, but any other R for analytics. Uh, so I think that's independently of if you're uh, distributing your data set, your your database or not? You, I think it's it's quite generic for for anyone. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. much.